Welcome to episode two of the Collect a Hobby podcast. Today's topics are going to include, should you support local gaming shops, eBay authenticity guaranteed, what does complete in box really mean, and sealed versus single versus graded cards. Stay tuned. You collect video games and you collect trading card games. Welcome to your new home and welcome to one of the most unique podcasts ever. This is the Collect a Hobby Podcast. We've been collecting for years, and we're up to date on all the latest trends in the hobby. Our website, collectahobby.com, is a social network for collectors made by collectors. Made by collectors for collectors. Welcome to your new family. This is the Collect a Hobby Podcast. And now, your expert hosts. Hector and Rich. Let's get this party started. What? what? Sounds fun. Wear your helmets. So let's start out with the first topic for today, and that is should you support local shops? And when we're talking about local shops, we're talking about for video games and trading card games. Do you think it's a good idea to support your local shop? I think it is 100% good idea to support your local shops. I think that they are a very important part of the community and very important part of the hobby. They're a place to go, see what's new, see what's up, maybe talk to other people. I love local shops. I love going to local shops. I love buying from them. Usually everything's marked at market value, like what you can see on eBay, maybe a little more because you know, they got to keep the lights on and pay employees pay rent and all of that, but I'm always for going for local shops. You can also check the condition. A lot of times, especially with cards, it's hard based on a picture. So you can go and you can look at the card in person. It's much better than just sending your money off to Amazon or eBay. You, you can talk to the shop owner. I know me and you went to a, that shop a couple of weeks ago and we spoke with the owner and he was very friendly. He gave us a lot of information. He was very nice. We had no problem spending money there. But what about the shops that overcharge? Mm -hmm. There's yeah. shops out there that would take an item, let's just say a sealed ETB right Pokemon, okay. and it comes out and it releases at Walmart for $40, 40 okay. plus tax. And you go to the local shop and they go ahead and charge 75 to $80. Mm. Should they support the local shop when they see prices like that? How do you feel about that? I completely agree on the other sense, right? You should always support your local shops because there's more to it than just what you're purchasing. It's like that nostalgic feeling that you get to see things on the store shelves like it used to be. And you go ahead and you can look at things before you buy. So I completely yeah. agree with that. But I think the part that people will argue with us, but what about the shops that overcharge? How do you feel about that? It's a real tough one, but... It's annoying when you go to a shop and like you said, let's use the ETB Evolving Skies, $40, for example, $40 ETB, you go to a shop and you're like, I'm ready to get this. They have it. I'm excited. And then you see an $80 price tag and you're like, you want to support the shop. You want to give them business. You want them to thrive. But at the same time, you can get two ETBs for the price of one. Maybe if the store marked up 10, 20%, where there's a little more for the store to get for everything else, but you're not feeling like you got ripped off. And I think the problem is that people are feeling like now it's no longer about supporting the store. It's about a greedy store owner ripping off its customers. And the store will always say the distribution's hard. This is in high demand, which is all valid reasons. But the customer is going to be like, why don't you just limit one per person? Why don't you just sell it for $50, limit it one per person, and then more people can get it. So I think it's really tough. First of all, keep your lights on nowadays, right? With the way the economy yeah. is and certain things, it, it is more expensive overall to do that. And mm -hmm. I think it's unfair if you think that you're going to go into a local store and think that they can compete with the likes of eBay, Walmart, Target, the likes of other stores that are just larger, right? There's different places that they could afford to do different things. And they can't compete against that directly. They might have an older collection that they might be selling. That's all they can offer you, plus an experience, plus a, a place to even test out the card. So if you're a person that plays TCG, they can offer you a location to play, which a lot of them do. They allow you to go play there, play tournaments, different things like that within the store. And that's something that they can provide you that Walmart and Target can't. And by you supporting them by purchasing the item, you're also helping them give a place for people to play a place for people to test out those cards you are helping provide for that for others as well and i think that's what they can do for you there's something else i want to add to this yeah. is 
I don't know if you realize this, but if you go to Target, if you go to okay. Walmart, there is a time during this whole pandemic, I think it's okay for me to say pandemic, so I'm going to say <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. During the pandemic, Pokemon cards and some Yu-Gi-Oh! sports cards as well, they put it behind the shelf. Why did they put it behind the shelf? Because at that time, everyone was going crazy with Pokemon. That uh -huh. if you got the MSRP version, you could go ahead and resell it for a lot more. Yeah. That's what made it super hard for these stores to compete. Let me tell you something that happened recently. If you uh -huh. look and see how overstocked Walmart and Target are. They're just lying on the shelves, right? They removed it from behind the shelf where they're trying to monitor how people are buying. And to me, that shows like they're showing less interest in holding trading card games and actually having TCG in there. Let's just say something happened where Target and Walmart no longer sold trading card game. Mm. What's left? Amazon? That's what's scary. When I was a kid, how did I get packs? Oh, when I went to the local video rental store, they had a booster box out of base set. My mom would buy me one pack. I would go to Target and they'd have some packs out. But if Walmart and Target are losing interest, number one, that's one less place that people can buy product from. And two, the younger generation is not going to be able to get it because they're going to say, oh, mom, can I go to PokemonCenter.com and buy this product that only you can get from there? It's much easier that she'll buy it at the checkout line. And I think that's what you're getting at. The last couple of years, have you tried to purchase something online? What happens when it's actually something that's good online? You're competing with everyone else. Whoever clicks the fastest gets it. So even if it was something good that you actually want to purchase online, it's going to be almost impossible. So you're going to need these local game stores. You're going to have to support them because if anything happens where they decide to stop selling it, if they just decide to stop selling it at Walmart and Target, then you're not going to be able to pick this stuff up. And that means you're only going to rely on local shops. And that's the importance of supporting them the best you can. For a lot of people, that's the only place they could play these TCG games. Otherwise, they're stuck on playing online and it's going to be just Master Duel the whole time. And you're not going to play the real TCG. We're talking about just trading cards right now, but it works the same for video games. Because you already see, you can't get those retro video games anywhere but local game shops. You could yeah. try to get on eBay and try to bid your way, but it's better sometimes to go to the local game store. Mm -hmm. You go there and you talk to the person and you actually get to see what the condition is for that game that you're buying. And yeah. maybe you can negotiate with them. Maybe they might give you a discount if you purchase more than one and you purchase a bunch. They may take off a couple of dollars here and there. Some owners actually do that. Yeah. If you build up a relationship with the owner, maybe you'll get some discounts. I'm not saying you 100% will. They'll call you when good things come in. If you make a good rapport with them, and then if you trade things in, maybe you can get more trade value. I think that we're going to such like a digital world where it's very easy to buy online, but the local shops are such an important part of the community. If you wanted to play Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic, you would go there and there would be other people there to play with. And if those go away, then that means interest is going to wane and it's just going to be so much harder to enjoy this hobby. Hey, I know a good company, a real good company that made it a lot easier for you to purchase cards online. In fact, they have a new authenticity guaranteed on their site mm. and they say you know what if you go ahead and purchase from us we're gonna make sure we guarantee this stuff is legit and of course that's the next topic i'm going to talk about right now it's ebay authenticity guaranteed so how do you feel about this and first of all can you even explain what this is rich i still don't understand what they do i feel like it's honestly like Yu-Gi-Oh! pod agreed no one knows what it does it's just there. So if you could go ahead and explain that to me, please. To my knowledge, it is when you buy a card over a certain threshold dollar amount, since you're dealing with an expensive card, the seller will then send it to a middleman at eBay, which I believe for trading cards, it's CGC and another one for sports. I can't remember off the top of my head. Then their experts there will look at the card, make sure it's authentic, put it in a nice sleeve with a card saver and then maybe a little holder or something and then they will ship that to you i think people have reported it takes about two weeks from end of sale to delivery from the seller to the buyer so it adds a little bit of time but you're getting a card that's authenticated by ebay i remember me and you spoke about this when it came out we were talking about it a little bit and it seems like there's just more questions than answers at this point it's a lot more questions than answers let's just pretend that i am the seller okay. i am the person selling you a card 
and you say, you know what, Hector, I like that card. I'm going to go ahead and buy that card. And I already mentioned what it is on the website because that's usually how it works. You put a description of what the item looks like. You take pictures and you post pictures, but that's not good enough anymore because now they want to make sure that this is legit slash if you're actually describing everything correctly. That's a big one too for me. So I'll get there in a second. So let's say I am selling a card to you and all of a sudden it goes to eBay first, or at least their person, which is CGC. It goes to CGC and CGC is going to look at the card and tell you, is this description correct? Yes. Is it a legit card? Yes, it is. eBay authenticity guaranteed. And then they send it out to you, the buyer. There's a couple of things that I don't like about that. In a normal situation, when I sell something to someone, it goes directly from me to you. We already have to take chances on things getting damaged through the mail, the packages getting lost and all this stuff. But at least you cut down on any middleman. It's going from the seller to the buyer. Mm -hmm. Now you have a middle person. So not mm -hmm. only do you have to package everything and send it to them, they then have to look at it and say, okay, it's good to go. What if something gets damaged on the way to the middleman? Yep. They look at it and say, oh, this is as described, and they send it back to you. Now I lost that money. My question is, what happens if everything looked good going to CGC? They say, okay, everything's good. And then they send it to the buyer, and something gets damaged along that route. Who gets charged for that? Do I get my money still? When do I get paid? Because I didn't damage it. In fact, you just said it was authenticated. You damage it on the way there. Let's say the package is lost or anything like that, don't they usually give you what the value is worth of the card? Maybe not what you paid for. So how does it work? How does that work in that situation? I don't have an answer for that. This process opens up so many more areas of vulnerability to get the card damaged, lost, like you said. Then who's the burden of proof on for damaging it? Can the seller claim that CGC messed it up? Can the buyer claim it? Because now we're adding a third person in this so it's very tough ebay clearly said that they will also check to see that the description is correct if someone says for example they have a psa 9 card that's how they describe it to get the attention of people to look at their posts on ebay if i send it to them and cgc agrees it's a psa 9 how is cgc gonna agree with that their grading system is different from psa 9. so how do they know if the description is correct, are they even checking that? Because my point is, let's say they do agree and they say yes, and a person receives it, say, wait a second, this doesn't look like a nine to me. We're basing it off of what CGC thinks. Mm -hmm. Do you see how that's dangerous? Because the minute it slips through the cracks, then that means it is officially guaranteed to be that. That's a very good point. Obviously, if I buy a card from you and you send it to me and you put in the title that it's, let's just take the numerical grades out of it. Let's say near mint condition. Your definition of near mint is different than mine. Now we're adding a third person in here who might have a different definition. What if in the description it says near mint, but the grader at CGC sees, oh, there's a scratch here that would definitely make this a played card or a light played card. It's no longer near mint. Would they reject that and send it back? And then the buyers, well, I just sent off a near mint copy of a card and now you're telling me it's not it. And maybe the buyer would have been willing to accept it. So who knows? There's so much here that I guess it's like a wait and see. I personally don't like the waiting two weeks longer. If they can really flesh this out and make it a really good service, then I'm all for it. But right now, it just seems like there's too many questions. One last thing I want to bring up with this topic is what about the charge? Right now it's free, but if mm. you think that they're going to spend all this time and have CGC do a service for them for grade and middle person, and you got to keep in mind, this is going to distract and take away time for CGC because it's going to take a whole nother department slash section of them guaranteeing this. There's no way they're going to do this for free forever. They're going to start take a percentage. I, I just don't like the fact that it's not optional. It's something that you have to do once you're over a certain price. That to me is unacceptable. That should be an option. I, as a buyer, should also have the option of saying, no, I would rather take my chances. At this price, take my chance rather well, than paying the extra fee or extra charge. Yeah, people are just going to start going on different forums, Instagram and Facebook, and they're going to just start selling on there and they're going to get rid of the middleman. This may start a whole new trend. There's going to be less people grading cards 
and more people just doing eBay authenticity guaranteed because a lot of people just graded cards to raise the value of the card. So they yeah, did, sure. oh, this card's worth more because it's graded now. But they're gonna be like, you know what? I could skip that step and just say it's guaranteed to be a PSA uh, 9 or PSA 10 or it's guaranteed to be whatever I want it to be. Are they gonna start grading? If the card's at CGC, personally, I like cgc slabs i have a couple i think they're very nice what if i buy a raw card and they have it and they say hey it's authentic we can put it in a slab for you we'll do it at a discounted rate since you bought it off of ebay is that something that might be in the works even though that sounds good that sounds like it could be a positive thing that could also be a negative thing do you think there'll be more influence to give a better grade because the fact that it came from ebay and it came in that direction and they're able to look at it you don't think there'll be a more favorable grade than something that just came into them indirectly possible Oh, while it's here, you can pay an extra charge to then grade it. I'll be worried about, are the people that are going from eBay to them getting higher grades than the people that are going directly to them? I have no clue, man. That, that would no scare clue. me. This whole process doesn't seem fletched out. And I know it's just a test thing, but I feel like it should have been optional. I've read a lot of people online are not happy about that as well. So I hope they figure something out and they can give people what they want. Because I do think for newer collectors especially, there is a group of people who are like, I've been scammed with fake cards, fake booster boxes. They get cards that are not in the condition that they promised, and they're out of luck because they got the card that they bought. There is a market for this. People would want to use it if it was done a little better, I feel. Honestly, if I was owner of eBay, the way I would have done it, is this very simple ready i would have had the sellers hand in before an auction and you'll have a separate auction called the ebay authenticity guaranteed auction you send those cards in and those cards are held by ebay or cgc or whoever's holding it during your auction and it goes directly to the person afterwards and the people that want ebay authenticity guaranteed they go to that auction directly separate that, from the regular auction that's DM. actually really <laughs> smart dude. could ebay just be like a PWCC and sell the card for you and then send you the money. Essentially what it does, right? If yeah. you do it like that, they're holding it, they have it, they're doing auction and it sends out directly to the person. The end. Everything's done for you. Everything's sent out for you. There you Good have to it. go. Problem solved. Going to the next subject though. What does complete in box really mean? Oh boy. Or I guess CIB, right? That's mm -hmm. what the cool kids are saying these days. If you go into eBay, you type in CIB, yeah. it's complete in box. So what does that mean to you? When I hear complete in box, I'm thinking mainly video games. I really don't think much about trading cards, but this is such an interesting topic because I know for like some games, especially back in the Super Nintendo days and the Genesis days, games came packed with other things that wasn't just the box, manual, and game. They had posters, they had maybe little trinkets. Remember those little postcards they would send away and tell us your favorite oh, yeah. games and we'll send you a free coupon or something? They had a lot of that stuff. So if I buy, let's say, one of our favorite games, Joel Mac 2, I know it came boxed with a poster. If I go on eBay and buy a complete in box Joel and Mac and it doesn't have the poster, is that complete in box? And then in the same time, it also came packed in with those little things. Remember those little Whoa booklets and like the Super Nintendo user manual came in every box? I guess the question would be, if you bought a complete in-box game, how much in depth do you want it to be original to what it shipped with when it was brand new? For me, I yeah. think complete in-box, if we're really going to call it complete in-box, that means it has everything, including the postcards. It has the original box that held the cart. Or for example, if it's a cartridge, mm -hmm. it will be held in the original box. It has uh, the poster, it has everything on it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there's other categories. When you say you have the game, the manual, the box itself, mm -hmm. you can have all three. But complete in box to me means that there's everything that came in that box, except it's no longer sealed. So you have everything that would have been there, but it's not sealed anymore. It was opened. So what about the little manuals, like the Super Nintendo manual and the, the Woe manual, the ones that come in every game? If you look at my collection, the ones that are complete in box has all that stuff. I will admit that they didn't all come like that. Going through different yard sales and different flea markets, I've been able to collect bits and pieces to put it together to make it complete. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like that to begin with for most of them. But to me, that's complete in box. Yes, I, I agree. The only thing is where I think I differ is on the little manuals. Yeah, posters, maybe postcards if it has Joe and Mac on it. But mm -hmm. little generic inserts and stuff that say, oh, here's our power players, we'll buy these new games, stuff like that. I don't really consider that complete in box 
because they were put in many different games. So I wouldn't consider that. But yeah, definitely it needs posters. It needs even I see a lot of complete in box listings and you can tell that the insert, like you said, that holds the cart is yeah. not original. And it's got to have the original. You can't have a repro one of that because I feel like that is part of the complete in box part. Even yeah, though well, you can buy other parts, it, I just feel like it's not. The whole purpose, like when you open it, you want to make it feel like it was the first time you opened it. And yeah. I think that's what a lot of collectors want to see. If you're going to say complete in box, I feel like it has to have everything that you would have saw when you first got it. And if it mm -hmm. doesn't, if it's missing cards or something, you have to mention that. And I think that's what... You notice some people do that for eBay. They'll go there and they'll be like, it's complete in box, except it's missing this. Yeah. And I think it's very important to say, fine, complete in box and it's missing this means that it has everything else except this. I think game box and manual is a difference from complete in box. And I feel like that's the purpose of calling it complete. I think you bring up a really good point. When I open an old Super Nintendo game and I'm pulling out all the pieces and I'm pulling out the manual, then here comes the poster and then here comes the little postcard. I remember when I was a kid opening those boxes and seeing all that stuff. And of course, I'm like, kid, I'm like, oh, a stupid postcard, blah, blah, blah. But that's part of the experience. I see all the time people post pictures of a PS4, PS5 game and they open it up and there's no manual and there's no nothing in there. But back in the day, we had so much stuff. It was like junk mail almost when you open those boxes and they had so much stuff in them but that's the authentic the original the nostalgic feel of opening that and remembering when you were a kid and opening that you gotta define it a certain way and the best way to define it is that it completely has everything that it needed to have the day it was released minus the fact that it's sealed that's the only thing that should separate a sealed and complete a box one's open and one is not yeah, I think it's a little disingenuous to list something saying complete in box when there's a key piece missing. I remember I bought the Joe and Mac 2 poster. I saw it come up on eBay. I didn't even care about the price. I just wanted it. I bought it. It cost me the same amount as the cartridge cost me. If I bought a complete in box Joe and Mac 2 and I get it and I realize, oh my gosh, it's missing the poster and the poster costs just as much as the cart, you're going to be really upset. There should be more than just complete in box and then game only or whatever there needs to be different i guess tiers so to say i think that complete in box really differs for everyone but i think me and you are on the same page where we want it to be as authentic to opening up a sealed box as possible it goes back to nostalgia again it's the fact that you want to make it feel like it's the first time you're opening it again and i think that that's why most collectors would want that it's because it has everything like the original and I think that's what most collectors say, right? Especially video game collectors. Mm -hmm. They always talk about it feeling and being like the way it was when I was a kid. And I think that's the biggest thing with the purpose of the website for collectahobby.com is to give you that feeling of the way you were when you were a kid. And I think completing a box is the best way to experience it. It's not sealed. And you mm -hmm. can look at the content inside of it and it has everything the way you remember it when you were a kid. Totally agree. Speaking of sealed product, the mm. next topic is going to discuss sealed versus single versus graded. I'm pretty sure if you're listening to this, you saw the first episode, you already know I like sealed product. And the only reason why is because I like to display it. I really enjoy just displaying things and looking at it and imagining what could be in there. Because I'll be honest with you. Anytime I see all these YouTubers and all these people, they post all the nice starlights that they got for Yu-Gi-Oh! Or they got these beautiful Pokemon cards and all these rare cards. I probably have the same thing. I never know because I'm not going to open it, but I'm sure it's in there right now. And I can look at it and I have my sealed ETB collection. I'm looking at it and it's gradually growing. Every single one's a hit in there. You can't disprove me though. Not one of you could disprove me because every single one are sealed. So we'll never know. But I'm telling you right now that they're all hits in every single one. It's Schrodinger's booster box. It could be rate cards or it could be nothing. I know that me and you disagree on this. I'm more of a singles guy. I'll get an ETB and I'll see it and I have to open it. I don't think I have any sealed product. I just like the cards. I get why people keep things sealed. It's a great display. You have the original that you went and bought it off the shelf, but I like the cards inside, so I'm trying to rip it and, and get that hit, get the good card in the set. But it doesn't bother you that you could have a Ghost Rare Blue Eyes in there. You could have a, a Ghost Rare Dark Magician Girl Red Eyes in the box, and you just wouldn't know. That would drive me crazy. If you looked at that box and you're like, man, I wonder what I have. All the motion that you have, just staring at it, think about what you possibly could have instead of you actually opening it. Because when you open it, it could be an amazing feeling that you get that hit, that card that you're looking for. Or it could be 
the lowest of lows where you got absolutely nothing. All the cards were no hits whatsoever inside of it, which has happened to me before. I know that's what it is. Every one of those card boxes, essentially you're gambling, right? Every single time you're gambling. But sometimes it's nice to just look at the art and remember the time period of when other people were open in packs and not me. <laughs> and I'm okay with that because I saw the highs of highs from other people and I saw the lows of lows from other people. And for me, I'm able to just capture that moment by looking at the seal version and looking at everyone else, open things and go crazy to try to get a hit. Oh yeah, I can relate. I remember maybe, what, what was it now, a year or two ago? I remember FaceTiming you and I was opening some Cosmic Eclipse and uh, some Evolutions booster boxes. After each one of them, I'm like, oh, I should have kept it sealed. But I know I can't. I have to open it. There's something about sealed product. I just feel like it's meant to be opened. I guess it's just how people view the product. I'm just so used to viewing it as a memory. It's different because you view it, or at least from what I could tell, you view it as the experience of opening a box. As for me, I'm okay not knowing what I would have got. Don't get me wrong. I obviously open packs. That's my thing. I try to keep certain things sealed, and sometimes I open multiple. If it's a good set, you'll probably see me open it at some point. Yeah. So that, that's not what I'm saying. It's not like I don't open anything. It's just that I prefer leaving something sealed. I have a thing where I've had all the Pokemon exclusive ETBs, and I intend on getting all of them from here on out. I also have other ETBs sealed. I have a lot of product that's sealed and I just prefer having it there for that memory without actually opening it. And that's just a preference, I guess. Let's take evolutions, for example. When I opened that, I wanted to get the Charizard. When I opened up Cosmic Eclipse, I wanted to get the secret rare Pikachu. When I didn't get them, I was like, oh, I should have just kept it close but that's the gambling that you're talking about and i could have just went and bought the card because i've heard stories online of people opening four hundred dollars worth of cards to get a fifty dollar card when they could have just bought yeah. it eight times over or they could have traded or something or even gotten a graded card for that price so what do you think about single versus graded cards that's something else i want to mention is that Notice how we are talking about sealed and single. I think a lot of people are starting to switch more towards that than they are graded. And I'm concerned because graded used to be the thing the last couple of years. You got to go ahead and get that card graded. And I feel like the fact is there's so many cards that are being graded at the moment. There's so many different companies popping up out of nowhere that are grading companies. I think it's starting to push people away from grading and going back to just being like, you know what, if I am going to have this card, I'm going to have it not graded and just keep it in my collection or binder and not grade it anymore. And I'm starting to see that trend. There's less yeah. and less people that are all about grading. The people that you see that are doing that, they're usually YouTubers. Aside from that, the real life people that are again at grading they're doing it to sell it. So if you're not someone that's planning to sell that card, you're going to not grade it anymore. Unless I pull a nice hit and I think that it has a potential to be a high score and it's something that's somewhat rare. And when I say somewhat rare these days for like modern product, I'm talking mm -hmm. about something like a Starlight for Yu-Gi-Oh! Something yeah. that you mm -hmm. really can't pull all the time. It's harder. A Ghost Rare, for example. That's when you can start to get things that are graded. And I think that's when it's fine to grade. But to me, I feel like it's either a single or, or sealed at the moment. I don't even think graded is there per se anymore. I know people may disagree, but I just feel like grading is meaning less and less every day. I know. I love graded cards and I'm coming to the same conclusion, man. Two years ago, you would take a $30 card, get it graded, get a 10. That's now a $400 card. And you're like, it, it just didn't make sense. Now that I guess the grading companies caught on. So now they've raised the price. So now are you really going to send in a $30 card for it to get a 10? And then now there's so many cards graded, it's going to come back. And now it's going to be like a $50 card and you're going to spend more money to buy the card, get it graded, do all that than what it was worth. So I think grading is going to shift to where not everyone's just grading anything, where people are only going to grade the top five to 10% of each set. And then all of your rare promos, all your rare Japanese cards, stuff like that. Because I remember when Evolutions was big, well, it still is, but back when it started going up in popularity. The whole Logan Paul, where it really jumped up. And it was all about Evolutions at that time. People would open Booster Box and they would get every single hit they got, they'd send into grade. Yeah. And then like now it's maybe just send in the Charizard, the Charizard V, and if you think you can get a 10 on this hard to grade 
Chansey or something, send that in. It's expensive to buy graded cards too. So I think that mm -hmm. everybody's shifting how they view graded cards as like this upper echelon of the top 10% of the cards in the hobby versus just, oh, I like this card, get it graded. Now, of course, people are going to grade their childhood cards, which I'm all for that. But like you said, people are looking at graded cards differently. I just think that if you look at grading cards in general, nowadays compared to before, we didn't know how to handle boxes back then. Mm -hmm. you, when you open things, you just broke it open and threw it out. Even when you try to save a box at times, you always had your parents clean up stuff and they threw it out. So if it wasn't you to throw it out, your parents threw it out. And that was the issue with video games. And that's why a lot of games from the NES days and Super Nintendo days, you can't really find those boxes. It's mm -hmm. more expensive to get those boxes. So when we're talking about the way people treated cards back then, when you collected Pokemon, when you collected Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic, they were trading card games and people played mm -hmm. the game. You may throw them in a binder, one of those old school binders that damage yeah. your card. You never treat them too well. And nowadays with modern stuff, people know that, oh, it's all about make sure you take it out slowly, right? Make sure you don't mess up the corners, make sure you don't mess up the surface. And everyone's very, very strict to the way they open packs, the way they got to packs, the way they do everything. It's so hard to get things graded today. And at this point, does it really mean anything? Because when you look at Pokemon, you and I have talked about this many times. There's literally nothing too unique in a normal Pokemon set. Pokemon is not like Yu-Gi-Oh! where just out of a whole case, you may have a Starlight. It doesn't work that way. It's really not even too complex to get some of these cards. So when you look at graded, there's so many of that card out there. Oh, I could get a PSA 10. And you look and there's 100, 200, 300 PSA 10s. What's the point? I think me and you learned this together at that point. Champion's Path, that came out, that was, you could not find that anywhere. It was selling out everywhere and everyone wanted the Charizard. I think when it first came out, both versions, the shiny and the rainbow, were both going for $1,000 each. And everyone's like, this card's so rare, it's so hard to pull, I've opened hundreds of packs and I can't get it. And then now we are, what is it, a year later, year and a half later, and you check the pop report and PSA alone has 5,000 of each graded in a 10. Is that card really that rare? And people were spending $1,000 on that card back then. And that's fine if that's what they want to do, that's great. But you can get a really rare Japanese promo card that you really don't see often for that price. Do you think they need to add another tier? Like maybe a one out of a hundred chance of pulling in a box or something, or like maybe numbered cards? How do you think they should do that? I think that every trading card game should have something that is there for someone to collect because at this moment, there's literally nothing that's going to separate a card from what someone else can get. And Starlights do a better job. I think Yu-Gi-Oh! does a better job overall for some of these sets. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they need something that's more for collectors to collect. Otherwise, you're going to have this issue where people are just going to want singles or sealed. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it's not worth grading anymore. But don't get me wrong. These companies don't care about people grading the cards. But the grading card companies have to understand that those days of people looking at, oh, this is going to be rare, it's not like that. The only thing that made the Charizards rare from base set is for you to find one in good condition because <clears throat> no one took care of it then. The chances of you finding a Charizard that came out in Brilliant Stars in perfect <clears throat> condition is a lot easier. Why? Because everyone that's opening them is making sure they're going to be perfect condition the only thing you have to hope for that it's printed properly if you go on ebay and type in brilliant stars charizard 10 copies of the one where he's flying with the venusaur if you buy 10 of those i bet at least nine of them maybe eight would come back a psa 10 because people open the pack they put it right in a sleeve like you said and then they sell it when we were kids all my cards were in a rubber band in my pocket and i was at recess when you were a kid did you even know what a sleeve was now you watch videos and parents are opening with their kids and as soon as they get that card the parent puts it right in a sleeve and there's no chance for it to get damaged i just think it's a different world people are more aware all oh, the cards from when we were kids are worth a lot of money now these new ones will be well if everyone takes care of them well, there's going to be so much stock of it. And I think this is probably the best way to end this episode with. As a person, it's a collector. Whether you collect sealed, whether you collect single, or whether you collect rated. Regardless of whichever one you collect, just make sure you're collecting something that actually means something to you. Yeah. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it was sealed, single, or graded. You're not going to worry about the value of it. You're not going to worry about, oh, the stock market tanked. Everything's tanking. The prices are dropping. You're not going to have to worry about that because at the end of the day, it meant something to you. When that happens, you will see that the importance of it 
having to be graded isn't that important where single needs to be perfect condition isn't as important as you think and sealed is not as important so when you actually like something you'll see that collecting for it is a lot easier couldn't have ended it better myself perfect way to end it let's just make sure we're collectors at the end of the day and that's what the whole website is about so any closing remarks for this episode rich no, I think we covered a lot of really good topics. I hope that if anybody wants to expand, they can go to the forums on the Collect the Hobby website and tell us what you think. We'd love to hear what you think about the episode. Awesome. All right, in that case, I'll see you guys next time. Later. You've been listening to the Collect a Hobby podcast. Hector and Rich have been collecting video games as well as trading card games for years. And they're up to date on everything that has to do with the hobby. For everything you could imagine and need, hit the website at collectahobby.com. You'll find the blog, show and tell, the vault, the forums, and so much more. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll see you next time on the Collect a Hobby Podcast.